Good morning. Good morning. Yes, go, go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, you see, please uh, um, let me first uh, apologize myself that I'm not with you today, but uh, my travel documents uh, are missing, so I could not tra cannot travel for the next weeks. However, I prepared a presentation because I think social security, social protection is of utmost importance for the region at this moment, it's always of utmost importance, but it's even more important now. And that's why I am very happy to share with you now my presentation. Uh, please let me first start with uh, uh, the definition of social security uh, according to the ILO. According to the ILO, social security is the adoption of public measures to ensure basic income security to all in need of protection in order to restore up to a certain level of income which is lost or reduced by reason of inability to work or to obtain remunerable work due to the occurrence of various contingencies which are sickness, unemployment, old age, employment injury, family responsibilities, maternity, invalidity or death of the breadwinner, and it also includes access to medical care. Uh, please let us also not forget that social security is a human right and as such it is laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which states that everyone as a member of society has a right to social security which means that everyone should enjoy at least a minimum level of social security but the social transfers and services are also powerful policy instruments to combat poverty insecurity and inequality and to achieve the millennium development goal Social transfers and services are, in addition, an economic necessity to unblock the full economic potential of a country. Because only people that are healthy, that are well educated and well nourished can be protective. And since the recent economic and financial crisis, there's also the widespread acceptance that social protection and social security serve as social and economic stabilizers in time of crisis, times of crisis. And we saw this in particular uh, when we compared countries with well-functioning social security systems in place and those who had to play, put in place ad hoc measures during the crisis, we found that those countries which, with well-developed social security systems could much better mitigate, mitigate the negative effects of the crisis. And then we have to look at the world population and we see that still 75 to 80 percent of the global population do not enjoy a set of social guarantees that allows them to deal with the life risks. Therefore, there is a need that all countries at once put in place at least a minimum social protection, a social protection floor through which no, uh, below which nobody should fall. Let us now look at the region. What is the situation in the Arab region? Uh, the Arab region has the lowest labor force participation rates, uh, with 50.4% in the Middle East, and 51.5% in North Africa in 2009. Also, the unemployment rates in the Middle East are the highest regional rates, estimated at 10.3% in 2009, while worldwide average was 6.3%. And here we have to see, uh, to recognize that women are even more affected. Their unemployment rate exceeds uh, 17 percent compared to 6.5 percent worldwide and we have immensely high unemployment rates for women for example in Yemen with 41 percent in 2008 uh, uh, Syria 26 percent Jordan 24 percent and in Lebanon was the lowest with 10 percent mm. and the situation regarding unemployed is even worse for the youth uh, young people 
uh, young people's unemployment rate in the Middle East amounts to 24.9%, so it's almost four per times higher than the average adult rate of 6.4%. 6 and again here we see that women are double penalized. In Jordan, for example, the unemployment rate for young women amounted to 46% in 2009. In Syria, it was even 49%. And Lebanon, again, was the lowest with 21.5%, which is also, in worldwide comparison, an incredibly or considerable high rate. Let us see the... Uh, employment as a socio-economic situation. Despite higher economic growth in 2011, the total unemployment rate remained mostly unchanged with large decent work deficits in the Middle East. Poverty and income insecurity are still a common feature of many Arab societies, despite recent rapid economic growth. And recent estimates suggest that about 20% of the Arab population, which equals to 34.6 million people, lived in poverty. Another feature of many countries in the Arab region is high informality, which translates into high social security coverage gaps. The estimates of selected countries are often below 50% of the population who have social security coverage. And again, here we have to say that women are more penalized. Only few countries in the Middle East reach coverage rates of more than 20 uh, of, of more than 10% of the population for women. So these are alarming figures, and. Uh, uh, we have to see how social security can cope with these. Uh, only few Arab states have developed coherent national social security policies. The policies are very often fra fragmented between social insurance, uh, which is very often under the responsibility of the Ministry of Labor or independent administered by an independent institution, by social safety nets are provided to different institutions and different ministries. So there is very few coordination and there's a, uh, at many countries lack um, a coherent national social security policy. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, most of the Arab countries have social insurance systems in place, which however provide only long-term benefits, like pensions for old age, disability and survivors, and employment injury benefits. However, only very few countries, in the, especially in the Middle East, offer short-term benefits, like unemployment and maternity benefits. Only Bahrain and Jordan have unemployment benefits in place, and only uh, Jordan has a maternity insurance scheme in place, which uh, uh, if a country does not have maternity insurance in place, it very much uh, hinders the employment of women. And also, most countries of the region lack protection against catastrophic health expenditure, a critical factor which is contributing in many countries to vulnerability and poverty. And uh, uh, none of the countries in the region has a rights-based social assistance scheme, which means that there is a protection in case of poverty. Most of the countries have safety nets in place. However, these safety nets try to target the poor people. And we will see later uh, that uh, in many cases, the uh, poor people are only marginalized, reached by the safety nets. Let us quickly have a look of the social security programs. Here we see what I mentioned before, that most countries have uh, old age survivors and invalidity social insurance schemes in place, but the, here we see that only very few countries have uh, sickness insurance, medical care, maternity insurance, and unemployment insurance, and family benefits in place. And most countries, or all countries, have safety nets, as we mentioned. However, 
uh, they do not follow the rights-based approach. And even if we look at the social insurance schemes, there are considerable wage defi uh, coverage deficits in the region uh, because most insurance schemes cover only workers in the public sector and in the private sector on regular contracts. Other workers such as temporary, agriculture, domestic and farm and migrant workers are to a large extent not covered. And uh, uh, due to the low level of formal employment participation, again, women have very low social insurance coverage. Uh, as we said, all countries have some kind of social assistance programs. However, the benefits are granted only on a discretionary basis, as opposed to clear rights and entitlements. And the providers of these programs range from governments to NGOs. A lack of coordination is of concern, resulting in the dupl duplication of support to some groups while others are hardly covered. Another issue is a funding because it is often decided on an ad hoc basis and it, this creates a high level of insecurity for the institutions as well as for the beneficiaries. And uh, when we look at social security expenditures, we also see that uh, Arab states are together with uh, uh, South Asia and with uh, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the lowest social security spenders. Uh, now let us see uh, how the uh, benefits, uh, safety nets, are uh, spent and uh, how they reach the people. First, let us see that uh, um, most of the safety nets consist of uh, subsidies uh, which often go on the, um, on the expense of more effective programs. And here we see, for example, that the uh, safety nets in Yemen, uh, the subsidies in Yemen reach up to 15%, and uh, uh, the Arab states have an average of 6%, which is uh, much higher than comparable uh, a comparable sample of developing countries in other regions of the world. When we see how uh, the subsidies are spent, then we see, let us look here for example at Jordan, but also the other countries demonstrated that in many cases rich people do even benefit more than poor people. And thus, we can say that in many cases, the subsidies are inefficient and pro-rich. Uh, here, I prepared a slide on the poverty impact of social safety nets in the main Arab region, which also shows that in many countries, uh, like for example in Yemen, in Iraq, in Egypt, uh, the impact is very low of the safety nets. And uh, uh, here we see on this slide that in the MENA region, many people live just above the poverty line and this makes them very vulnerable to poverty. And uh, the World Bank carried out a very interesting survey and uh, it asked the people in Arab states whether they have been in the last 12 months uh, times uh, when they did not have enough money to buy food uh, which their family needed. And we saw that in 2011, for example, the at uh, times that people could not buy food was much higher than in 2010 and 2009. So we see that poverty is increasing. And uh, then again, the World Bank asked in this survey uh, whether people were satisfied or dissatisfied with the efforts, how the government is dealing with the poor. And we see that in many countries uh, the satisfaction is very low. 
So in Lebanon, only 20%, uh, a little bit above of 20% were satisfied. Morocco, 30%. Egypt, also 30%. However, when we look at the uh, Gulf states, then we see that there is nearly full satisfaction how the government deals with the poor. Um, here we do have a slide which, just one moment, uh, which shows whether people do have preference for benefits in cash or in kind. And this is mainly related to whether people uh, prefer cash benefits or prefer um, uh, subsidies. And here we see that most of the people prefer uh, cash benefits in opposite to subsidies or in-kind benefits. In order to uh, assist countries uh, to combat poverty and to reach the Millennium Development Goals, but also to be equipped for economic crisis, the chief uh, executive board of the United Nations launched in 2009 nine initiatives to confront the crisis and the social protection floor initiatives is one of these joint nine initiatives. It is a global and a, uni uh, and a local UN action which is led by the ILO, by the WHO, to promote access to essential services and social transfers for the poor and the uh, vulnerable. And it includes a basic, I will jump now over to slide, or one slide because we do not have too much time. It includes uh, two parts, the social transfers part and the essential social services part. The social transfer part relates to basic health care, child benefits, assistance for the unemployed and the poor, and basic old age widows and invalidity benefits. While the essential social services part relates to access to health services, access to water and sanitation, education, housing, and other social services. Uh, as the ILO is the uh, uh, the lead agency for assisting countries in putting in place so the social transfer part of the social protection floor. I have made for you an extra slide here to better explain for you the social transfer part. Uh, the first element is that all residents have access to essential health care, including maternity care. The second part is that all children should enjoy basic income security, which should provide access to nutrition, education, and care. And all persons in active age who are unable to earn sufficient income, so for example, in case of sickness, maternity, unemployment, or disability, should enjoy at least a basic income security. And all older persons um, or widows should enjoy basic income security. And this benefit uh, uh, should follow an outcome-oriented approach taking into account the national conditions, the priorities, and the institutions. And uh, um, these benefits should be provided uh, based on principles uh, uh, which relate to universal coverage. So countries should aim at providing universal basic coverage of these benefits to all the residents who are in need. And of course, if countries do not have the means at once in place, there should be a gradual implementation based on national priority setting and national dialogue. And the benefits provided should be sustainable. There should be fiscal, financial, and economic sustainability. And these benefits should increase with available fiscal space in countries. Uh, also, this benefit should follow a rights-based approach, which means that people who fall into one of these contingencies should have a legal entitlement. And this also means, when uh, we have a rights-based approach, that these benefits should be budgeted 
in advance and they should not be provided on an ad hoc basis. And again, we should, uh, these benefits should be provided with a view of, of the adequacy and a focus on outcomes. Um, there may be flexibility as to the institutional arrangement, however, there should be a coherence and a coordination and efficient of the overall social security system. And finally, uh, countries should envisage when providing basic social security benefits to move progressively forward to provide higher levels of protection according to IRO standards uh, to their people. And the world community found this approach so important that the ILO, after 63 years, again uh, adopted last year during the International Labour Conference a new international labour standard, which is a social protection floor recommendation, and which is a key instrument to promote social inclusion through helping countries, providing countries with the guidance to put in place a social protection floor through basic social security guarantees, through these four social security guarantees. And here we see how this new uh, recommendation uh, provides guidance to member states. First, to establish and maintain social protection floors as fundamental elements of the national social security system, and then to progressively uh, build and maintain a higher social security uh, levels uh, uh, to as many people as possible, guided by higher IMO social security standards. And this is a vertical dimension, the progressively ensuring higher levels of protection, while the horizontal dimension relates to the guarantee of access of essential health care and the minimum income security through the, four, uh, through the three transfers. And here we see uh, that the social protection flow can be achieved through different systems, which depends on the national choice, on the national, national circumstances and national uh, traditional systems. It can be achieved through social assistance schemes, social insurance and universal social security schemes, or a combination of those schemes. However, we have to look at the nationally guaranteed outcomes so that we really people have these outcomes guaranteed, have a social protection floor guaranteed. And if we do have a social protection floor in place, then we can guarantee uh, a better education, better training, and better health to people. People will be more employable, and they will be employable in the formal economy, and ultimately pay taxes, which again translates into higher levels of social protection. And that's the virtuous cycle of development. And now you may say that uh, it might, might be very expensive to put these four social security guarantees in place, or this social protection flow in place. The ILO made research and uh, found out that uh, social protection floors are uh, financially viable and affordable in nearly all countries all over the world. And here we show that, for example, old age survivors and disability pensions in most countries in which we carried out the survey uh, or the examined, the financial examination, uh, that these benefits uh, cost less than 1% of GDP. Child benefits, the costs depend very much on uh, the number of children in the countries, and uh, in some countries it might be very expensive, especially if the benefit is provided until 16 or 18 years. However, again, there could be a progressive extension to more children, to, to older children, for example. But it is important to start with a basic benef benefit for children. And here we see the estimated effect of the cash transfers of, on poverty reduction. Okay. So we see uh, that... Can you hear yes. me? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Up, please. Okay, 
So he, you will see in the PowerPoint presentation, I have different, several other slides which show the impact on poverty uh, in the countries, uh, different countries, which have already successfully put in place social protection floors, like Argentina, like India, like Thailand, like Brazil, and South Africa. Uh, so what is very, very important for the future, for the Arab states, is that uh, uh, we need to pay attention to politics of social protection in relation to social justice. Social protection is much more than a service delivery because it shows what type of society you want to live in. Social protection must also be multi-sectoral in its design and delivery. Uh, social protection should be linked to the labor market, to health, to poverty reduction and governance policies. And it should be embedded in national, in a national social protection strategy. Uh, again, uh, we, we have to admit that comprehensive social security systems represent important social tools that can temper the exclusion and latent or simmering unrest. Thereby, they can contribute to creating more cohesive and inclusive societies. And national social protection floors, if a country has it in place, it goes beyond providing basic social relief. National social protection floors foster the forms of democratization that build citizenship and they break down barriers that impede fuller participation by the poor in the political process that affects their life. And I think this is much more relevant at this moment for the Arab states. Thank you very much.